Aziz Rafi, Afghanistan is a very important part of Aziz Rafi. Aziz Rafi is a very important part of Aziz Rafi. Aziz Rafi is a very important part of Aziz Rafi. Aziz Rafi is a very important part of Aziz Rafi. Aziz Rafi is a very important part of Aziz Rafi. Aziz Rafi is a very important part of Түүнчлэн Афганистаны сонгогчдын чадахыг бэхжүүлэх төслийг санаачлан хэрэгжүүлсэн бөгөөд өвөг төсөлд 6.2-оос 11 сая хүн хамрагдчихжээ. Азиз Рафи 1981 онд Кабулын их сургуулийг инженер мэрэгжлээр суралцсан төгсжээ. Хамгийн төлөө их орны чин юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуухаасаа өмнө та өөрөө их орны гэж Сам байцхан уу өрхөн хөндлөгчтэй. Өнөөдөр орны де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор манай холоос ирсэн Афганистаны зочин Рази Рафи ирээд байна. Good evening, Aziz. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Mongolia. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we have, uh, in our program we talk uh, at the beginning about the person about you. Please tell us about you. Oh, my name is uh, Aziz, as you mentioned. I'm coming from Afghanistan, and I work in Afghanistan. I have lived in Afghanistan, born in Afghanistan, and still working in Afghanistan. I'm uh, working in an organization called Afghan Civil Society Forum. It is an umbrella organization of civil society groups, and we work all around Afghanistan in all provinces almost. Civil society? Yes. How big is a civil society? Uh, you mean my organization or the uh, civil in society? General in the in country. general, I think civil society has a very strong root in Afghanistan, but the current and modern concept of civil society is a bit new, and uh, we are about actually to establish it properly in terms of its existence and also in terms of legitimacy. How is the situation in terms of peace and normal living conditions in your country? Well, we are a post-war and in-war country. So we are actually passing a very bad war, and we are entering to a new war, which is currently actually between the insurgency and the NATO forces in Afghanistan, and also the American forces. Uh, but in general, the situation is going into a positive uh, direction. What Which are means the reasons of insurgency? There are two reasons for insurgency in Afghanistan. What is the, one is the fundamentalism, the, also the legitimacy of the insurgency for themselves. Um, like we work for democracy, they work for their own legitimacy. And the, the second issue is economic interest. And I think the legend of the economy is getting stronger than the other one in uh, undermining the power of the fundamentalism and also the regional um, conflict, as we, as we said. But the uh, economical interest in Afghanistan is getting a bit more um, you know, recognition, particularly the economic conflict in Afghanistan. And the war in Afghanistan is slowly coming to the uh, economic era. So you are almost probably whole generation spend a, at war? I think we are in 35 years, and this is the 35th year of the war in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, the war is, has destroyed all the infrastructure, the trust among the nation, the um, uh, spirituality of the, and the morality of the society has been destroyed. The in economic infrastructure has been s destroyed. Poverty is erupting and increasing day by day. And the war actually has lost the trust of, or actually destroyed the trust of people towards the future, which majority of the people, particularly who are living in the rural areas, in the mm, countryside, they have lost their trust towards the government. And the government is not able to provide them basic services and facilities. Or oh, peace. And peace and security, as well as the protection, which is very important. 
There was a BBC competition on compositions around the world, and a small young schoolgirl from Afghanistan won the prize. Who wrote that? She would go to school, but is not sure. She was not sure if she came back she home came or not. That's very true, actually, because insecurity is an extreme dilemma in Afghanistan, and uh, the government is not. Uh, providing protection to the citizen, and citizens are very, very much concerned about. Uh, the, I mean, the safety factor is not there. The the safety is not. The protection is not there. There is a big. You don't feel that you are secure. Big army of uh, NATO and ally alliances, and uh, then uh, then the insurgents still fight with them. So it should be a huge uh, war power on their side to fight I mean, with this power. I mean, the war is coming along with the war for, with Russia. Uh, but I was trying to compare Mongolia last night with my colleagues and say what are the differences between Afghanistan and, Mag and Mongolia, and what are Mo Mongolia, and what are the similarities between Mongolia and Afghanistan. You passed almost 35 or 70 years of peaceful environment, and you were transition from a socialistic type of government to a liberal type of government was completely in a peaceful and law enforced environment. In my country, we are actually coming from one conflict to the other conflict. We are coming from one war to the second war, to the other war, which is extremely tough for the people, for the people who do not want to be part of this war and who do not want to be engaged in this the majority. security, which are the majority. I mean, currently, the almost 80% of the people is being hijacked only for the sake of 20% of the people, of the ones who want to war, the war, and the war is in their benefit. As I said, the, not only the fundamentalism or the Islamism, but also the um, uh, economy is one of the main reasons of war in Afghanistan, which is access to resources and also regional uh, interest for this. And this regional um, power, regional actually influence into Afghanistan, because all the neighboring countries of Afghanistan, like you have problem with China, we have very similar problem with our neighboring countries. You have also problem with Russia, but you are very lucky because you have two neighbors. We have seven neighbors, and all of them are interested in Afghanistan, and all of them wants to. China is also our neighbor. Pakistan is our neighbor, and Iran is our neighbor, and they are very stronger than us. They are very powerful than us. So we were talking about the neighbors. Uh, yes, we are in between two big neighbors. You are in between six of them. Seven of them. Seven of them. <laughs> Which are? I mean, the Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Pakistan, and China. Almost many of them have on They are very supremacy. powerful countries. I mean, except the Tajikistan, which is very smaller than us and also poorer than us. The other ones are very strong in terms of their economy, in terms of their politics, in terms of their stability, establishment, and all the infrastructure that they have. Pakistan uh, is an atomic power. Iran is an atomic power. China is an atomic power. The three others, the four others, are not very, very strong. Afghanistan is a, is a landlocked country yes, like Mongolia. Like Mongolia, very similar to Mongolia. Even to the yesterday when we were traveling to the. Uh, Banur, Baganur? Yes. Baganur, um, coal mine. Coal mine. Uh, I was actually looking to the landscape when I thought and I felt that I'm in my country. I'm at home. See. So it was very similar to my country. What is a distance t to the closest ocean port? It is about uh, 400 kilometers in Karachi in Pakistan. And Karachi, Pakistan. Yes. Okay, what brought you to Mongolia? Uh, we actually part of a um, study mission for the EITI experience in Mongolia, where you have done it very well and you have been very successful in this process. Relatively. We, uh, I think in comparison to my country, you are very successful. So we are actually trying to learn from your experience and see if we can get something from, from your understanding or as well as practices here and take it back home for, for our people. Extractive industry, transparency international. And initiative. Initiative. Yes. Uh, 
what do you what makes you to think that this country is successful in this initiative um, the way the way that you have actually established your relation with the investors as well as also the transparency that you have provided to the people and also through the government involvement as well as the civil society involvement and sort of engagement the public people or people uh, public and private, private sector part uh, participation uh, will, you know in, in a way that you have been able to manage it properly to make in the benefit of your national interest and also in the long term and sustainable development we would love to see it in Afghanistan for our country well um, extractive industry we talk about mining and other uh, mineral resources we have and uh, recently there was a big announcement on uh, world news about how rich Afghanistan is. What is that about? Afghanistan is perhaps, I should not compare with Mong Mongolia, but I think it, we are 200 up to 300 times more richer than you. We have um, minerals like iron, like copper, um, like gold, uranium, lithium. and uh, lithium recently, and many, many others which have not been discovered yet. Then Only how you'd know? Because the geographical, the uh, space survey that they have done has shown that Afghanistan should have at least up to $13 trillion only in one-sixth of its soil. So um, that is, I think, more than the... How was, uh, I mean, how much of it you are using? Uh, at this stage, um, we don't use it at all. Uh, if, if you compare with the amount that we actually do it. Even the, uh, if we do it, if you do use it, we do it, we do use it in a very unprofessional way. The only thing which is uh, growing up is the marble industry. Mm -hmm. uh, construction which, material. Construction material. These are the ones that we are having, and then we have billions and trillions tons of this available in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. We have mountains of marble. Uh, Who is a foreign investor in that industry? Um, it's at this stage, our small investors and the neighboring countries' investors. Uh -huh. The biggest international investor in Afghanistan at this stage for, for the future of the, of the mines and uh, min, min minerals is uh, China. China has contracted the copper at the south of Kabul city, which is uh, also in the south of the country as well, southeast of the country in Logar, only 65 kilometers, sorry, only 45 kilometers it from is, the uh, Is it exploration or production? Uh, it is exploration, uh, two stages. The second phase would be the exploration. So they got a license for exploration yes. with a continuous right yes. of production. They have, done, they have done the contract and then actually they're doing it and they, the contract, they have won the contract in a competition between the three, four, which we are actually now learning about it more. We wish that we had this information before these contracts. I think, but Afghanistan is very rich. This is the only 15% of the copper that we have in Afghanistan. And uh, I, I have forgotten, I think it is um, six, six, 60, 600 billion tons of copper. Of copper. Yeah. And it is not only copper, it is a multi-metal mine. It is a multi-metal mine. It has lots of other... So, uh, in terms of mining, now you start exploration and with... Uh, the first phase of exploration was done by the Russians. And the second was also done by the Russians. The How much uh, covered the country? Um, the, unfortunately, when the Russians left Afghanistan, they took all the documents with themselves. We don't have the clear information, the clear clue about what is, how much it is, and how much it was in the first and the second uh, ge 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 geological survey and the Have you been uh, Afghans working with the Russians? Um, a number of them, but who are not actually now in, the, in Afghanistan. Some of them have migrated from outside because they were part of the Communist Party uh -huh. and they could not live or go along with this current government and the majority of them left Afghanistan, uh, which is a very unfortunate issue for Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, because of its politics, is very sensitive and we uh, do not tolerate each other, which is, a, which is a disaster in Afghanistan, the tolerance. But however, still you are uh, experiencing uh, coming back of your yes. 
Yes, there are lots of, lots of lots of Afghans who have returned back to Afghanistan, and it's very good uh, and it's a, it's a green light for us for future of Afghanistan. Hopefully, within the next fifteen ten years, once the peace is there and the prosperity is there, people. How many Afghans do leave abroad? I think the total refugee number of Afghanistan is not very clear because there is no survey for them. But something around five million people are living outside Afghanistan. Along with 32 million you have inside uh, of the country. Inside Afghanistan, based on the official data, the total per, you know, population of Afghanistan is 55, 25 million. Uh -huh. It's 25 million. That's the official number, the official mm. But th we have never done the census. Afghanistan has, has only had one census, uh, the whole you know, history and the whole um, the course of history. When was that? And that was 1978. 78. This yeah. is just the end of the Russian war. I, no, actually, the start of the start Russian, of the war. It's the first year of the Russians' invasion in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. Was 78, where the Russians. What happened with Russia at that time? Um, the Why they have invited you? Um, actually, uh, the invasion or the occupation in Afghanistan by the Russians was had political reasons from their side, but they are. I couldn't see any benefit for the Russians' politics in Afghanistan, and I don't know why they actually attacked Afghanistan. It is a, still a very strong question for us, why they attacked Afghanistan, why they in, occupied Afghanistan. It was not in their benefit at all. Um, Afghanistan is a country, an un, unconquerable country. It was no it ten years of war? Um, actually, we, the war with Russia was uh, ended in 1960. 1986, 87. 87, 87, 87 that is almost, yes, almost 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and who won? Well, we are the losers. Afghans are the losers. We don't know who, who is the winner, but we are the losers because we lost. You know, that war, war has no winner, particularly the one who the, the fighting is happening on their land. Any country who is the, the victim of the war is a loser. Exactly. I mean, the, 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 there is no benefit for the... For and the, still you have losers. Yes. Still the war still we are there. losers. Still we are losers and we are losing, actually. That's, that's not a very strange thing for Afghans, you know. Um, Afghans are very famous for being a warlike people, but I think we are always losers. Afghan was once a, the largest producer of opium in the world. And still it produces a, a substantial yeah. amount of opium. Yep, I mean, I mean, uh, the reason there are two reasons for that, perhaps three reasons if you see the, the social one as well. One of the reason is the um, lack of uh, um, strong, um, severe government in Afghanistan, where government cannot control the territory properly, and the insurgency is more dominated the areas, which are very, very cultivative, very, very rich in terms of the cultivation of the. It's in the north? Uh, Europe, it's in the south. In the south it's in more south warmer, a bit. More warmer and also good water, good land, and um, good environment. And also close to the borders of Pakistan and Iran for trade, it's very easy to trade it and take it outside Afghanistan quickly. And processing is also very possible there because the vast area of control of the government is not very much there. And controlling that area is also very difficult because of the mountains and because of the Deserts. It is, it is a mix of mountains and deserts, and it's very difficult. The very parts parts of that, you know, if you go out of the river, you know, a bit away from the river, it is very dry, so it's inaccessible. So that's one of the reasons that the the lands there is more cultivated with opium. The second reason is poverty in Afghanistan. We suffer from poverty, and people want money, and the only um, how do you product. understand poverty uh, under how many percent of this 25 million population? Well, because we don't have figures in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Uh -huh. But the, the uh, when, I'm, yeah, when I'm saying about the talking about the figures of, as I said, on the population, um, I think um, it is more than according to the to the doc data and the uh, numbers being quoted in the UN documents and the. Uh, Western's documents and the Eastern's document and Russian's document. 
I think we are 90% below, 60% below poverty level. Which, align, which is two dollars per day. Uh, which is, um, I think, in terms of two dollar, I'm talking on one dollar. One dollar per day. If you consider the two dollars per, per day, yeah. it should be 90% of the population is living below poverty, or at least 80% of the population. Okay. Uh, what was the third reason for helping? And the third reason is the regional actors in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They are very powerful in the government of Afghanistan. For example, Pakistan is very powerful. India is very powerful in Afghanistan. Iran is powerful in Afghanistan. Russia is very powerful in Afghanistan. And they have they their influence own through certain regions? Through certain, or? certain groups, certain political parties, certain um, agendas and channels of money that they have in Afghanistan. It's, it's very... You know, 30 years of conflict in a country in a country certainly create lots of channels for for people who want to use it and utilize it. And you know that the intelligence today, the war, war, the war is war of intelligence. You have the information, you can win the war. I understand there was a statistics that if all allies spent this money that spent for the war, if it was used for peaceful. Uh, development of the country it could make a lot. True. So much money. I wish um, I had the right figure, but um, it is unfortunate, very unfortunate, that we don't have the right figure. Mm. The figures that we have is more imaginary. People talk about $160 billion or trillion dollars. When uh, the economy is around it, 20 billion. Uh, it's less than 20 billion, actually. It's, it's almost one in one, two billion, two, two and three billion. Three billion, economy. the official statistics. I mean, the, 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 with the amount of the money being spent on war and on warfare and the current dilemma of Afghanistan is far, far more than what so. we receive, actually. The ordinary budget of the country, the current budget, is about a billion. And the development budget, a billion dollars. And the development budget is almost two billion, which is three billion. That's the total amount of the funding of the government. While the war money is about trillions. In Three by trillions. Uh, there were recent uh, also information in the international media about corruption. How do you see? What's your perception of it? You know, Afghanistan... If, if I enter from the other way, you know, and we are in 30 years of war. We have no production at all. We have our farmers, they are not producing. Uh -huh. Our livestock people, they are not producing. Our factories are not producing anything. But we have nobody dying from poverty. We, have, we are very poor. Uh -huh. We are in, uh, under poverty. Uh -huh. But nobody is dying because starvation. of poverty. No starvation. Starvishing because of the poverty. The reason that this is not happening is because the amount of money coming to Afghanistan is far more than the expenditures. So the investment in Afghanistan is far, far more and bigger than the need of that country. And this is the disaster. This is actually the main reason for the, for the um, corruption. And it's extremely important, you know, if, if, if people focus on this. The neighboring countries of Afghanistan is investing in Afghanistan. The regional powers are investing. India is investing, Pakistan is investing, Iran is investing, Russia is investing, Saudi Arabia is investing. A huge amount of money coming in Afghanistan. And this money is being channeled through different channels and leaders in Afghanistan or groups to Afghanistan and to the people. Something is reaching down to the grassroots level as well. And this is why Afghanistan is never feeling secure because the channel of money are so many different. And unfortunately, in the agenda, international agenda arena, we also have the same problem. You know, if you talk to the Americans, they have completely a different agenda for Afghanistan. If you see, to, <laughs> to talk to the Germans, they have a different agenda. British, they have a different agenda. And these agendas are not actually <coughs> matching each other. They are actually rather crossing each other. And unfortunately, because of the lack of a proper leadership in Afghanistan, we cannot find the intersection of these. Inter, you know. Speaking about leaders, um, there was an election. Yes. And there were a motion that uh, it is not going to be accepted, the result. 
You mean about the latest uh, parliament election? President election. No, president election was last year. Yeah? Last year. You're talking about well, this. That, about that election. Okay, and right. then uh, I think former minister for foreign affairs, yeah. somebody was competing with him. Yes. And then he said, and he looks like he had a very strong voice then. But that was, he was sort of right. Then suddenly he had uh, said, no, I will not run for presidency anymore. What happened? Well, thanks to the God that we have this environment now that we are accepting and not accepting the... We are a post-war and in-war country, and I think this is the best practice of democracy. And I'm very happy to, to see that even in Mongolians are concerned about this. I think one of the good things with democracy is that uh, you agree or disagree, but you, at the, at the, at the end you, you will convinced that something is happening which is actually accepted by the majority. I mean, the last election was a huge amount of fraud. In this election, the, I mean, you're talking about the presidential election, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the, the parliament, parliament election. election. Both, you know, both elections was, were full of fraud, and the fraud was there. Uh, the very organized fraud happened. But, you know, in, if, you, if you see it from a post-war and in-war country, you completely, you know, give a different analysis of what is really a perspective, what is, what is really happening. The, the reality is that even if uh, the legitimacy is there, let me just say it this way, the legitimacy is there. I mean, whatever fraud is happening, is happening. So no one, is, no one can stop it. I mean, I mean, no one is there who has not done the fraud. The winner and the loser, they both committed fraud, both. There are, I mean, I mean, in the parliamentary election of Afghanistan, there are 2,500 people. I think I can guarantee this, except one person, one person who himself did not commit a fraud. The 2,499 uh, people, they did commit fraud. How many parliament seats? Uh, 250. And 249, on, yeah? on each, you suppose, 10 is running yeah. for? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's very strange, you know. It's very strange. In Afghanistan, people do commit fraud, and but they never claim that I have committed the fraud. How the many, others committed the fraud. How many political parties were running? We don't have political, but this is our actually major concern for us. We don't no. have political parties, but we have the... Of course, the co political parties that we have are the remaining of the communist regime, groups yes. and also the Mujahideen groups, which are political parties. And they actually, unfortunately, our system is presidential. In the presidential system, we don't have the, it is, it is a single non-transmittable vote, mm. which is a disaster. I must say it's a disaster. So everybody can One run. of the, failure, the failures of our democracy is that we don't have political parties. Um, democracy can only exist with political parties and unfortunately we don't have this. I hope within the next five years or four years we would be able to establish good political parties and democratic political parties where people can actually come together. So how many uh, do you expect political parties come and uh, participate you know, in election I, in the future? I expect, I should expect something around 16 to 20 political parties in Afghanistan at this stage. Okay. in order to clear the lines of conflict among the society and among mm. the people. Because in Afghanistan, there, there are different lines of conflict. Mm. For example, ethnicity is a line of conflict. Language is a line of conflict. Political affiliation is, or background is a line of conflict. The uh, status of economy or economic status is a line of conflict. Mm. The region, which region you belong to, is a, is a line of conflict. Mm. These are the, the, the issues, and, and, and of course, the many other issues in Out of these diversity. many uh, lines of conflict, as you said, uh, how about the language? You have six different nations. We have 36. Nationalities. 36, 36 nationalities. 36 ethnic groups, yeah. Ethnic, ethnic groups. groups so each yeah. speaks one language, um, almost. Some share languages, some share languages. Yeah. So and what uh, is the language that they speak the among each other? The administrative language uh, in the whole country, the major one is, is Farsi, is Dari, because everybody can speak Dari. Dari. Uh, while um, the government is dominated by the Pashtuns, which is the Pashto speakers. And uh, Pashto is, 
is the perhaps in terms of the, the Pashto in Farsi and Dari, they are both official languages of the mm -hmm. government. They are equally dealt with in the government at the government level. But majority of the people is because Farsi is very easy. Dari is very easy. It's like English, very easy. And the grammar is very easy. People for Farsi, speak for their Farsi, for Dari. Uh -huh. We call it Dari and it's Farsi. It's mm -hmm. the same language. It's mm -hmm. like Iranians, but mm -hmm. only the accent is different. It's like uh, American English and British English. I see. It's, it's very same language. So how do you then, I mean, you speak uh, obviously very good English, and I have been meeting people from Afghanistan who always spoke very surprisingly well English. Um, how the, much English is spoken? Uh, the English speakers in Afghanistan are very, uh, very few, it's not that much. In, in the past, uh, before the war, before the communist coup, we had the, uh, all our curricula in the university and local languages, in Farsi and Pashto. Majority were in Farsi. Mm. And uh, we had never felt the need to study any foreign language for study. Unless there was a higher education scholarship or something that people were applying, mm. and they were going for learning a foreign language, which was English and German and French, these three, three main languages. After the communist coup, majority of the people, educated people, they went for Russia, for Russian, to learn Russian because Russia was providing scholarship courses for people and study. So Russia got a bit of, uh, you know, importance in Afghanistan, or the Russian language got very important importance. Uh, but uh, English was actually, I studied in, in Farsi in my university in Kabul. And I learned English in Kabul. I've never been outside Afghanistan, so I have lived all my life inside Afghanistan. You have been traveling a lot? Uh, recently, only, only after the um, um, fall of the Taliban, I'm traveling. But before that, I was completely inside Afghanistan. And I'm still inside Afghanistan, living in Afghanistan. However, there I understand there are more and more Afghans are coming back. Is it true? It is, it is not more and more, but there, there are lots of committed Afghans who love their country, they, who love their homeland, and they want to... They are looking for be a better... There. They want to have a prosperous Afghanistan and live in Afghanistan. Is that true that there are Mongolians living in Afghanistan? Uh, well, uh, this is a number of questions that we still have here, but, um, you know, I was checking a number of walls in the past five, six days, uh, I, I can see the number of the words that we have, like, um, for example, Batur or Batar that you use, Ulan that we use and you use, the uh, Ulus that you use, we use as well. Uh, a number of other words that I can't remember now, but there are many words that we share. Similar words. Similar words, which means that there should be a sort of cultural relation between you and us. From the uh, genetic perspective, there should be a number of Mongols. I, I, I don't believe if Chinggis Khan came to Afghanistan and stayed there. Afghanistan is not a place for a conqueror to stay. None of the conquerors had uh, We're staying. stayed in Afghanistan because Afghanistan is very mountainous, like, like Mongolia, very cold, very dry, and in, in um, summertime, very hot very, and very cold. A number of Mongolian may, li may have liked the nature and have stayed in, in particularly in areas like Bamiyan and Ghazni and uh, Uruzgan and uh, areas like Ghor. But uh, I don't believe if they have stayed there in Afghanistan. Maybe they have migrated in a, in a proper way uh, ages before than the Genghis Khan attack in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. While the documentary or documents or the history shows that the Hazaras particularly, who, who have a very similar face like Mongolians, they were there before the Genghis Khan attack. And they were actually there according to the uh, Shah Nomad, the one of the uh, myth book of Afghanistan, one of the famous books of Afghanistan, and shared between Iran and Afghanistan. Um, I think the uh, Suchins, the, which called the, the Mongols, should be the Mongols, the original Mongols, or the Hazaras is written as Sochins. Uh, they m have been there for many, many years before the Genghis Khan, at, m at least 600, I can say 600 at least, based on that, kitab, on that book. You, you have, how many days you were staying in Mongolia? Um, actually, we are leaving tomorrow morning very early in seven. Uh -huh. 
-hmm. And during this this stay, uh, what you are taking with you, ideas? Well, um, impressions. The first thing that I will take is the warm hospitality of the Mongolians, which is unforgettable. I think they're very friendly people, very polite, very polite, always cooperative, and I appreciate that. It, we have never. We. I never felt that I'm not at home. I thought I'm at home, and, and I really. How enjoyed. many and who were your in your delegation? Uh, what kind of people? We are. We are ten people. Uh, from the government of Afghanistan, from the civil society, and from the uh, EITI initiative that we have in Afghanistan. We also have people from private sector and from the international uh, investors in Afghanistan. We have one Chinese colleague. Mm -hmm. with us, friend with us, and uh, we have two uh, from the civil, uh, from the private sector, mm. actually including the Chinese, uh, the Chinese friend, we have three private sector, three mm. civil society, uh, one government and three EITI. So you, you came here to learn what we are doing or to study yes. what we do? Yes, we okay. came here to learn how you experience the EITI. Mm. and how you actually struggled with the dilemma of transition from the communist regime to a liberal, to a communist or centralized economy to a liberal economy. So, I, and I think we, our take is very important. We have learned a lot. We have taken a lot of things now into consideration, particularly the how to deal with the challenge of the law and law enforcement programs and advocacy for change into the law, um, as well as a number of um, coalition building mechanism for um, putting pressure onto the government or inside the government, and also making lobby groups. These are the experiences that we have learned. And the um, most interesting meeting that we had was when you were a member of the parliament, uh, members of the parliament, also members of the government. And of course, we were very impressed with the civil society as well. Who Today, was your host? Uh, our host was the Open Society Forum, and we are very thankful to them. And they did a very good facilitation for the whole trip and the tour and the exposure visit. And I think we learned a lot, and the, the whole trip is funded by the OSI, the Open Society Institute. Well, very nice to hear that, and uh, we are lucky to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good luck with your uh, next mission to Thank you. make better Thank Afghanistan. You. We hope to see peaceful. you as well in Afghanistan. I mean, one day we hope to have a peaceful Afghanistan that we can have you there as well. Thank you very much. You must welcome. Thank you. I need to do a horn tune. You hit that horn as soon as I'm. Ta uru horn you hit that horn. Young, but you're right.